All right, just one second while it loads. All right, so hello everybody and welcome to our final presentation of the day. Here we have Courtney Vale, the campaign director of the Oceanic Preservation Society, also known as OPS. Ms. Vale, if you're all ready, you can go ahead. All right, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I wanted to, to talk today about Oceanic Preservation Society and our documentaries crimes against nature and us, what it means to us. And at the heart of this presentation is really how to inspire social change and positive impacts for the planet. And we think film is a powerful way to do that. So before I begin, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist and social scientist and have worked in the conservation and animal welfare field for over 30 years, primarily on policy, government, and global impact programs. And while I focus on impact campaigns for OPS, the rest of our team focuses on creating films and visual displays like our projection events that I will share with you further into the presentation. So I started out in the field as a biologist and then I moved into the policy arena for most of my career and have had the, I guess, privilege and opportunity to engage with some of the most complex and controversial issues facing our planet and have focused on what I call crimes against nature. And we all have different roles to play. And mine has been to see the issues holistically, engage with all stakeholders and try to broker dialogue to bring parties to the table to discuss solutions. And what I've found is that most of the ecological problems have a human problem at their core. And these are what I call the human or social dimensions of environmental issues. And it's what makes all of the environmental issues so, so challenging and complex. And this will be relevant to my presentation about films and social change and how we motivate and inspire action. And what I want to talk about today is just that. It's the power of film as just one tool we might have to make positive change. So what do I mean by crimes against nature? Um, our assault on the natural world takes many forms. As a basic working definition, I'm calling all activities that are inhumane or excessively destructive that destroy the soil and the land, the oceans, and really our natural life support systems. They might be legal or illegal, but the common factor is that they are destructive and unsustainable. Uh, some of the images I have here portray crimes against nature from, from our perspective. These might take the form of whale and dolphin hunts, destroying the biodiversity of the rainforest to plant palm oil or, or raise beef, or even targeted vandalism of wildlife. Uh, you'll see an image here of a bottlenose dolphin that was shot in the Gulf of Mexico. It's an increasing trend there. Uh, we're seeing more and more dolphins wash up with gunshot wounds. So it, it can even refer to the fossil fuel industry uh, that is responsible for oil spills and pollution and ecosystem decline. So that's what I'm talking about when I say crimes against nature. They're human imposed or anthropogenic activities that destroy nature. Um, and some of these images are from our work in the field where we have documented um, such things. And OPS really focuses our lens and our cameras to expose crimes against nature so that we can think about and find solutions. Uh, to, to these complex problems. I also wanted to provide a note here about ecocide. There's a growing movement internationally to recognize the rights of nature. And this could be the rights of a stream to flow unimpeded or the rights of a forest not to be logged or you know, the rights of a mountain uh, to, to maintain its, its ecosystems and wildlife. And so in some countries like Peru and Ecuador, rivers and natural areas actually are considered persons. They have personhood. They're entities that have legal and constitutional rights. And even though they cannot speak to human society to defend themselves, they can have legal representatives. And all of us can be representatives and voices for nature. And this movement recognizes the rights of nature and has spawned another movement, one that recognizes crimes against nature as ecocide. So ecocide is defined as the destruction of the natural environment by deliberate or negligent human action. And at least 10 nations have codified ecocide as a crime and is punishable by law. So this is, this is good news and it's progress. 
And so next we can think about why does it matter? Why does it matter to us? And this is where the, the connectivity to the natural world comes in. Our health, of course, is connected to the health of the planet, especially in this time of the pandemic. Uh, most uh, of us have felt the, um, the impact and, and sometimes in severe ways. And the origins of the pandemic are zoonotic. They originated in wildlife and passed to humans. So we are in this lockdown and lives have been lost and billions of dollars spent. And it will happen again because we have a, a broken and dysfunctional relationship with nature. And it's a powerful reminder that we're all connected and a powerful reminder that our consumerism is driving many of the threats facing our planet. So we're increasingly vulnerable to zoonotic disease and the, the concept of one health um, it shows us that we're all connected. And um, you know, as we tear apart the fabric of ecosystems and the natural world, we'll become more vulnerable just as wildlife communities and ecosystems are vulnerable. Many of you know probably that we're in the sixth mass extinction event and scientists have indicated that species are disappearing at an unprecedented rate. So this ongoing mass extinction event is probably the most serious environmental threat to our civilization today because it's irreversible and it's accelerating. And the rapid loss of species we are seeing is estimated to be between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than the natural extinction rate. And of course, species are connected to and support ecosystems. And as they disappear, these ecosystems are likely to disappear as well, leading to a domino effect for, for human, humankind. We also know that uh, frontline and disadvantaged communities are marginalized and are at higher risk from pollution uh, where illegal mining or chemical plants or industrial complexes sometimes are cited in, uh, in, in these neighborhoods and these communities. And oftentimes they're on tribal lands and sacred indigenous lands. And um, these, these communities have to to rise up and confront uh, this, this environmental injustice. And this is where I wanted to highlight frontline defenders uh, and another reason it matters because human lives are at stake and human communities are fighting for their homes and their health. A record 227 environmental defenders were killed in 2020 and three quarters of these killings occurred in Latin America and many in Colombia. South America is ground zero for rainforest destruction uh, by illegal mining, logging for beef, palm oil agriculture or drug trafficking, which often goes hand in hand with trafficking of wildlife. So those who try to defend their lands are often indigenous peoples and even environmental activists with bodyguards have been killed internationally defending nature and their right to a healthy environment. Here in the United States, many of you might have been following some of the pipeline protests and more recently over 1,000 arrests were made in tribal communities uh, protesting the expansion of an oil pipeline in Minnesota that would have threatened their sacred lands and waters. So these water defenders have been labeled as eco-terrorists when in fact they are protecting the rights of nature. And while it might be safer here in the US to protest destructive projects, global communities risk their safety and lives defending nature every day. And it ultimately benefits all of us and the global community and our global health. But there is always hope. And I call it the power of one. As individuals, we, we truly can make a difference uh, and the science proves it. We, may, we might think that we have to have a solid majority to make sweeping changes and attitudes and practices, but social scientists have shown that when just 10% of the population holds an unshakable belief, that belief will always be adopted by the majority of society. The finding has implications for, for all of us and how ideas, beliefs, and change can catch fire. And of course this cuts both ways, but, but here we're talking about positive uh, impact for uh, a better world for all of us. And of course, changing attitudes, which is part of the puzzle, you know, action is required and changing laws and policy to reflect changing attitudes is required too. And then when I speak about the human dimensions of environmental issues and problems, this is what I'm, I'm speaking about, how people think and, how they, and what they believe will influence what, what can be done about it. When we think about climate change deniers and those that ignore the scientific facts in order to condone environmentally destructive behaviors, this is an example. And this is an example where the application of science can be so important to shaping policy to shape our world. And we all can be scholar advocates using the best science to support our positions, our policies, and our campaigns. And at its core, we're talking about how do we shift social change so that we can create a more humane and sustainable future for all of us. 
So where does OPS fit in all of this? Well, our, our vision is based in a belief that films are powerful tools uh, for social change. Many of you might be familiar with Luis Ahoyas. He's the Academy Award-winning filmmaker and executive director of OPS. And I'd like to share this quote because it reveals the essence of who we are and our belief that film is a powerful tool to scale social change. So OPS was founded in 2005. And at the time, Louis had never made a film before. The Cove was our first film and it put us on the map. And in looking for a focus for, for the film, Louis followed his passion for the ocean. And he was introduced to the dolphin drive hunts issue at a marine mammal scientific meeting in San Diego in 2005. And I was at that meeting presenting on, on the issue as, as a group of scientists. And this is where he got connected to the issue. And The Cove took about four years to produce. It won an Oscar for Best Documentary, among many other awards, and it was a covert operation. The film team took many risks to expose this practice. And I know it's difficult um, to, to witness and um, to even watch, um, but the film did expose what's happening there. And this is another crime against nature. And The Cove has made an impact. The dolphin drive hunts are they're brutal, they continue to this day. The, the entire process is inhumane for those that are not aware of it and have not seen the film. It involves herding dolphins from out at sea using high-speed boats. They're chased and driven into, into a cove and they're held for sometimes days before they're slaughtered for meat or they're kept alive for sale to marine parks and aquaria across the globe. And many dolphins die during the process alone uh, during the chase and are separated from family members. It's a, it's a horrible, um, issue that we don't think belongs in a modern world. But um, the film has made a difference uh, and the issues are so complex. Uh, one of the biggest, I think, impacts is that activists in Japan have actually you know, risen up against the hunts and they're working to raise awareness in their own country. And this is important. That's how change happens from within country as well. Dolphin and whale meat is no longer available in school lunch programs in Taiji after the film exposed dangerous levels of mercury in whale and dolphin meat. There's been an increase, a decrease in the numbers of dolphins taken during these hunts and more reputable zoos and aquaria no longer source from these hunts because it's a public relations nightmare. So international condemnation of the hunts continues, but the hunts also continue. So there's, there's more work to be done. Our next film was Race and Extinction was released in January of 2015. And, and here we teamed with Vulcan Productions, uh, Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft and the Discovery Channel to broadcast in over 220 countries in the first 24 hours of release. The film, this film focuses on, on the global wildlife trade and the climate change, uh, two topics that are front and center. And hopefully some of you have seen Race and Extinction. In tandem with the release of uh, the film, Race and Extinction, we worked with Obscura Digital. It was a creative studio known for producing large-scale visual events with state-of-the-art technology and to literally project imagery on iconic buildings, such as the Empire State Building, the United Nations Building, and St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. The United Nations projection uh, occurred in September of 2014 at, around the UN Climate Summit in New York. And we always try to... Um, do these projection events around key conferences or events that will further amplify the work and reach the, the biggest audience possible with our messages. The UN projection uh, achieved 42 million impressions, 200,000 online video views and reached an estimated 10.4 million people. And that was just on that day. And of course, as you know, people watch the videos of these events, even more people are reached to um, share the messages from these projection events. The second projection event was at the Empire State Building in August of 2015. This event achieved 939 million impressions, 1.2 million online views, and reached an, an estimated 70 million people. The Vatican was a special event for us, extremely special as we um, received the invitation from the Pope. And this, this followed Racing Extinction, the release of Racing Extinction, and uh, it occurred in December of 2015, achieved over 4.4 billion impressions and reached an estimated 147 million people. Literally the entire world was, was watching. And this was a gift to Pope Francis on the opening day of the extraordinary Jubilee of Mercy. 
which is a period of special prayer that occurred uh, for over a year. And it was meant to open the doors to the church for more people to display more mercy and to, to do something uh, about the environment that was the focus of the Vatican during that time. And because this event is so special, uh, I wanted to share a video with you so that you could see, um, get a little taste of the power. Apologies, here we go. So we're going to continue doing these projection events. Uh, we recently uh, held one at the Climate COP 26 in Glasgow, Scotland, at the Armadillo. That's the upper middle picture in the, in, in the center there. And there are lots of iconic buildings around the world and iconic structures. And our next projection event will be at the UN around World Oceans Day. So I encourage you to keep your eyes out for it. As far as our films, returning to our films, uh, many of you may have seen one of our more recent films. This was directed by Louis and OPS and produced by Refuel Productions and James Cameron of Titanic and Avatar fame. It was co-produced by some other big names for any athletes in the room, including Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jackie Chan and Chris Paul. So the film was released in September of 2019 and quickly became the number one bestseller on iTunes and Netflix. Netflix. Um, Game Changers tells the story of an elite special forces trainer who travels around the world on a quest for the truth behind the widely held belief that meat is necessary for protein and strength and meeting the special athletes and soldiers and scientists and cultural icons. Um, he discovers some things that change his life forever and his relationship with food. Uh, and all in reality, it comes down to the fact that protein comes from plants. Not just you know, not just animals. So this this film is uh, for those that want to seek an alternative to uh, meat protein and to see how athletes uh, who have adopted plant based diets are thriving in the athletic world. Uh, the film also embodies one of our biggest campaigns, and I think we think one of the biggest solutions to planetary and human health, and that is to encourage a transition to plant based diets. And our latest release in 2021 um, was a film based on the Book of Joy and the conversation and friendship between the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And while the Archbishop recently passed, this film will serve as a living legacy of their special friendship. It's not yet out for general distribution, but I encourage everyone to watch it, uh, as, it as it comes out and available on streaming services. So what is in the pipeline? Um, for OPS. Let me go back here. There we go. Um, we have about eight projects in motion right now. We are currently filming in Northwestern Indonesia, where palm oil plantations are destroying one of the most unique ecosystems left on earth, and where the commercial wildlife trade is decimating native species. The, the Loser ecosystem is the only remaining place where elephants, tigers, rhinos, and orangutans exist in the same habitat. This will be our fifth film and should be coming out in 2023. 
And with films, you can argue that all that really matters is how many people and how many households are reached by, by the message, messages in the film. And we know that making an impact is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, these are the snapshot to give you the numbers and the metrics around the projection events. But we know that this is not the whole story. Um, the numbers mean that we have the potential to reach communities with images and messages. And that's where we have to start. But we have to ask, did our films make a difference? And part of our challenge is motivating, inspiring, and then catalyzing action. And we know it's really difficult to care. It takes a lot of work to care and then to act. And where we direct or channel that inspiration from our films is just as important as the content of our films. Changing hearts and minds is the first step and perhaps the easier step than changing people's behavior. And then when we throw in the complexities of culture, tradition, religion, and belief systems, what I referenced earlier as those human dimensions of environmental issues, we see that it's not a straight line, right? From powerful film to individual or collective behavior change, which is the real solution. And sometimes measuring this change is even more difficult. But scientists have attempted to empirically measure the social impact of documentaries and other compelling media and have found that films can indeed influence culture, politics, laws, and more importantly, they can change the course of history. And maybe most importantly, art can touch people and make them open uh, for a different viewpoint or usher in a new worldview. Um, I challenge all of you to think about your favorite or most disturbing film and whether that changed your life and how it changed your life and whether it made lasting impact. I can tell you that as a five-year-old child, what I witnessed on TV changed the course of my life and set me on a path to want to protect wildlife and protect the environment. So, so we know films can make an impact. When we think about our films uh, and look at the cove, arguably dolphin hunting has been reduced in Japan and activism is on the rise. Uh, race and extinction, we worked with partners to actually expose the illegal trade in whale meat that was going on in a restaurant in California during the course of our filming, as well as we were able to get protections for sharks and rays and other wildlife at CITES, which is an international convention that regulates wildlife trade. And with Game Changers, the interest in veganism and plant-based diets is on the rise and has escalated uh, exponentially uh, since the release of the film. And the global plant-based protein market is exploding. Uh, and it's projected to, to only keep growing and research around alternative protein sources is, is increasing as well. So we have our films and then we have our campaigns and our policy work. And I won't necessarily go into detail for, for each of these issue areas, but these are all areas and issues and threats that we focus on in our films. And we, you know, collaborate with partners around the world to, to um, take action on these issues. And I encourage you to visit uh, our, our website so that you can learn more about the, the campaign and policy work. And I can certainly touch more uh, on that as, as we get into our discussion. And as I mentioned, this slide is just to note that we are stronger together. You know, we, we work with no less than 11 global coalitions to address all of the issues I mentioned before. And you know, while each of us must take action in our own lives, when we work together, we can foster long-lasting change. And I don't know, I don't know if you remember the last one of my earlier slides where I talked about one drop can become an ocean. I didn't speak to it, but it was on my slides. You may have seen it. So as as just we may just be one drop in a big ocean, but together we become that ocean. And, and that's a powerful, powerful tool for all of us to keep in mind. And then I, I want to return to Louis' quote about the film, about film being the most powerful weapon of mass construction. But there's something even more powerful, and you don't have to be a PhD or a celebrity, and that's you. And by harnessing what you love to do, whether it be art, music, engineering, education, law, biology, each and every one of us can be a responsible consumer and an agent of positive change. That is really where I want to end my formal presentation because the only real solution is for each of us to act like the earth depends on each of us because she does. And there is no somebody else when we think of who will take care of a problem or find a solution. And there's really no better time than to take one step in the right direction today, whether it's to reduce our carbon footprint, reduce our meat intake or hold our elected leaders responsible. So with that, 
I will, I think, turn it over to uh, Q and A if that if that works for everybody. So let me stop. Let me stop sharing my screen. If I can, if I've got multiple monitors here. Hang on a second. You're fine. There we go. Perfect. All right. So we got some questions. The first one is, if plant-based diets are an option for someone due to health concerns, what can they do to still help the cause? I always like to um, take the reducitarian approach. So, you know, it may be extreme for some communities, some individuals to fully um, eliminate animal protein from their diets, but to reduce that intake uh, will have uh, tremendous benefits. The alternative plant-based um, alternative protein industry has come up with uh, so many, so many, not only taste, tasty and delicious, but healthy alternatives for animal protein um, that has such pro profound impacts for the climate and for animal suffering and, and for deforestation uh, uh, and the like. So, um, reduce, reduce if possible and find plant-based alternatives. There's so many now that could be possible. Um, and I would encourage those that have health issues to consult with their, of course, their, their doctors and providers to find, find the best alternatives possible. Then is there a way to push for legislation that protects these animals? Yeah, I, I see that, especially the dolphins being shot in the Gulf. And I can share my, my, my paper with those of you that are interested. I did an analysis of this growing trend in the Gulf of Mexico specifically. And it's a complex issue. Of course, dolphins, all marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So it is a crime to shoot, harass, or harm marine mammals, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, right? So we have laws on the books to, to protect these animals, but people break the law. And I was part of a coalition of groups that worked to, to set up a reward that would hopefully encourage members of the public to come forward to identify the perpetrators of that, of that crime. So th th that's always working uh, in the background uh, where, where citizens uh, can um, contact the government to, if they have information about these crimes. And I encourage everybody to, to, to do that if they have knowledge uh, of these of these types of things that, that happen. Um, have you ever partnered with indigenous groups doing when doing research and such? Yes, uh, that's we work closely with with many. Uh, I'll give you an example. In in Colorado, there's an initiative to restore and reintroduce reintroduce uh, the gray wolf to Colorado. It was the gray wolf was exterminated extirpated uh, in the 1940s from from hunting and eradication. Uh, campaigns and we worked with the Global Indigenous Council uh, to bring to bring uh, Indigenous voices to the table in Colorado, and we also have partnered with uh, Red Road to DC and other Indigenous coalitions that are working on the front lines of climate climate issues and traveling to DC to hold the the current administration, the Biden administration, um, accountable for policies that are failing the environment. So yes, we 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 work closely with and support indigenous groups and their, their fights on the front line. And is there a website where we can donate to OPS? Of course. And actually, if I type it, will you see it? Um, yeah, if you could type it in the chat. Okay, actually, I just did it. I did it on the Q&A, but I'll do it in the chat too. It's, right. OP, it's opsociety.org. Okay, here I can copy and paste in the chat for you. Okay, okay. Yes, please visit our site. There's 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 so much uh, information there. There's ways you can take action now. There's an action center. And I'm happy to speak to any of you um, after the presentation or you know in months to come if you uh, need assistance or information or to be connected to other individuals that are working on specific issues. So please stay in touch. How do you decide where to put the production displays and what inspired the projections? We're always looking for the most iconic buildings uh, and structures. So with the UN, because they were hosting the climate cop and um, it just, you know, they have a nice facade on the building. You have to choose a building that you can actually see the imagery as well, but you can 
you can see with the Empire State Building how despite all of those windows, we were able to use high powered projection cannons to, to get that imagery up there. So it's a, it's a really complex process through permitting. We have to seek permits uh, from you know the state local level uh, for many of these buildings. Uh, there's special rules around how these use, these buildings are used. So it's finding the, the best structure that has the biggest impact, but also that we're permitted <laughs> to, to actually put those displays on. So the next one will be on another UN building in June. Um, but there's, um, but the, but the world is our oyster. It, it just depends on how we, um, how we can get permissions around some of these, these large, large structures that, that provide us a perfect opportunity to reach the most people. All right, and then what are some ways as kids we can help the environment? I really think at, at, at the core is to find something that you're passionate about because that means it will be lasting, that, that you can adopt and incorporate your, your love for the environment in, in your daily life. So like I said, if it's, if it's making music, if it's sharing OPS films with your families and communities, hosting a screening uh, to raise awareness, um, obviously being conscious of what you consume and how you consume it, uh, carrying a, carrying a, a hydro flask around instead of a single use water bottle. There's so many different ways to start. Um, and as I mentioned, really paying attention to what you put on your plate your dinner plate, it, it can make, it can make a, a huge different difference for, for carbon footprint and um, maintaining biodiversity. This one's kind of similar, but what is the best way we can reduce our carbon imprint? I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's adopting a plant-based diet. Uh, the animal agriculture is the second largest producer of global greenhouse gases. So at least reducing meat intake will, will be a big start. And of course, uh, if you have the opportunity to, as you get older and, and think about buying a vehicle, uh, electric vehicles, while they have an environmental footprint as well, uh, that's a way to, to work to reduce a carbon output. You can work to support legislation that puts a carbon tax, uh, you know, a tax on carbon that makes polluting more expensive. And we're, we're working with several coalitions and working with legislators to do just that. So you can use your voice. Uh, to raise awareness. And I, I think your generation is the most equipped to do so because you have social media. You all become so adept at, you know, reaching out and sharing your messages uh, to, to large groups of people and you're not afraid to do it. So do what you love and find a way to have your voice be heard. Then what are your favorite plant-based meat alternatives or recipes? Uh, so I, I can tell you that we have partnered with Good Catch, which is a plant-based alternative for seafood. If you guys like seafood, you can check out Good Catch and there's a whole section on, of recipes there. They even have an OPS inspired recipe. Um, I, I like, you know, Beyond Beef and Impossible Beef um, and using that uh, in place of, of meat. Um, so, and, you know, salads are always a great option and legumes like chickpeas, um, you can do so much with it. And I can tell you that you probably won't miss meat if you, if you try, <laughs> and there's so many different ways to prepare it. So I can direct you to some great recipes for those that are interested. Um, can, the ghost, can the Coast Guard help stop poachers? Yeah, they, they do, they're involved. Uh, the National Marine Fishery Service under the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, I work hand in hand with law enforcement agents. And not only do they try to um, discover and uncover illegal fishing, which is a huge issue, you know, illegal and un un unreported fishing, they're on the water and they're constantly um, checking boats and things like that. But it's, it's difficult. There's never enough enforcement agents on the water. And so it's really, really difficult to find perpetrators. Hence, we, we try to encourage and motivate folks to come forward by setting up those rewards in the case of the dolphin poaching. Think about your 10 year olds. And then is there an animal that you think needs more help than others in terms of conservation? Well, you know, there's a critically endangered species where there are just less than 20 individuals like the vaquita 
The vaquita is a small porpoise in the upper Gulf of California. It only lives in that habitat. There's estimated to be less than 12 individuals, and that might be a high estimate. So it's very tenuous. So the vaquita and the lots of populations of tigers just have a few hundred individuals. So um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of species need a lot of help, honestly. And if we can protect ecosystems rather than the individual species, we're able to then protect more species at the same time. Um, but the critically endangered species where there's just a few hundred individuals, the North, North Atlantic right whale, there's less than 350 individuals. I can, I can cite so many marine mammal populations that are critically on the edge um, and that need our help. Um, what challenges have you faced as a woman in such a male dominated field? It's a great question. And I, I can tell you that in my younger, when I was younger and working on Capitol Hill, um, doing congressional work, um, there were there were definitely times uh, where, you know, um, I was intimidated and um, there was overtures made by members. <laughs> and that's that's a constant um, challenge for, for, for anybody, right, um, to be professional in environments where um, you might be the only woman or you might be the only person of color or you might be younger than others. But um, I think that when you're so convicted and you, you, are, you fully believe in what you're doing, you can withstand any of those pressures um, that many people face. And as I mentioned, in, in this line of work, when you're running up against you know, sometimes criminal syndicates that are involved in the wildlife trade or folks that want to see you, you know, fail because they want to keep exploiting the environment or killing, you know, a dolphin or whatever. Um, you know, it's risky, it's risky business, but um, when you believe and are convicted in your beliefs, um, I think you can overcome these obstacles that, that many of us have faced. Then do you think Colorado will ever help bring back gray wolves due to the ranching industry? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and I'm right there in there, work with the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. I'm an advisor and uh, have been there since the ballot initiative a few years ago when the public voted to bring wolves back. And we're, we're trying to work with the ranching industry um, that see wolves as threats. And as you might know, there have been a couple of predation incidents already. Uh, three cows were killed by wolves that were migrating into the state from probably Wyoming. So even before formal reintroduction, that's supposed to happen in 2023, there's already conflict on the ground. So we're working our, our best to support the ranching community because we want to see them succeed and we don't want to see wolves shot and persecuted, right? That's happening all over the West. So it's, it's complex and that species has been persecuted for decades and it's going to be, it's going to be a tough road. It's going to be a tough road. And then going off of that, how many dolphins do you think are killed each year from this? From the, the shooting in like in the Gulf region or yeah. in, in hunts across the globe? Because dolphin hunts still happen all over, all, all over the globe, not just in Taiji. They occur in the Caribbean as well um, and off the coast of South America and even in the Amazon with the river dolphins. But um, it's about... You know, it depends on the year, but over the last 10 years, if you look at the data, there's been about 40, 40 dolphins that have been killed in this way. Some have been shot with arrows. Some have been shot with guns. Um, some of the, the fisher, fisher folk have um, put pipe bombs in the water. You know, sometimes dolphins get, you know, in the way of the fisheries, right? So there's another area where conflict and competition happens. And, and, and usually the, the dolphin loses out on that one, unfortunately. Then how important is data analysis in developing your campaigns? It's, it's important. We, we, you know, rely on science to underpin, you know, all of our campaigns. There's always going to be room for values and belief systems, right, to, to take part in, in campaign work and advocacy work. And you're always going to have a spectrum of approaches and strategies, even if you have the same data. 
set before you. And we know that, and we've seen with issues like climate change, that despite the facts, the scientific facts, there will always be deniers. And there'll be those that want to drag their feet and uh, continue to do what they do. And, you know, and sometimes that's us, right, as individuals. And even if we're well-intentioned, sometimes it's hard to, to do the right thing, and especially if the industry doesn't uh, make it easy for us to do that, whether it's with plastics or, um, you know, fossil fuels and things like that. So um, I think that, I hope that answers the question. Um, has there ever been a setback in your research that made you question your um, path? And if so, how did you overcome it? Hmm. A setback in research. Um, there's been setbacks in campaigns, for sure. Um, early in my career, as I collected data in the field, when I was with Fish and Wildlife Service, I questioned the data that was collected that sometimes harmed animals in the hope that it, that data would be used for the, for the greater good of, of a species, and that that data didn't go anywhere. That data sat on a shelf in a report and never got applied or never got integrated into policy. So for me, the science, if it's not applied, um, that's, 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 that's disappointing and that's the shame of it, right? But even with that, um, that's what led me to advocacy and policy because I think that to translate that science into action and, and into good policy is, is, should be the goal of science. And then what steps did you take to get to your position at OPS? Uh, gosh, well, I started, as I said, out in the field as a fish and wildlife biologist. And then um, I, was, I went to law school and I met an individual activist that I had admired since I was a, a little girl. And that activist is the one that jumped on the tuna ships, the Panamanian tuna saners, and actually took footage of dolphins dying in um, tuna nuts and that went viral at the time we brought that to Congress and now you have that dolphin safe label on a, uh, a can of tuna. So when I was in law school I met this individual Sam Labuddy and then I started working on advocacy, advocacy campaigns um, after that with different environmental groups. And then after that um, I pursued a degree in psychology because I knew at the heart of most of these issues is our ability to change attitudes and, you know, and behaviors. And that's, that's a psychological <laughs> problem. That's a psychological issue. And that's where the social sciences come in, right? So, and then I was working, I'm just, as you, I was working on these issues, I would run into Louie and uh, the team at OPS and one thing led to another and here I am. So a long history of working with many nonprofit organizations and working on many issues have brought me brought me here to, to OPS. A little bit of serendipity as well. Um, what other film topics is OPS looking at during or, or doing after the National Park one? Uh, as, the, as far as projection events or films? I, I missed that, sorry. Um, films. So we have a film, uh, films and a docu-series that will hopefully be out in the next couple of years on a streaming platform dealing with plant-based diets, uh, looking at unified theories of health that um, is focused on research in, um, in, in humans uh, and how we can arrest certain diseases like Alzheimer's. So there's research components to these films and it's, it's kind of picking up where Game Changers left off. So we've got a few films related to that. We have a plastics film that's going to look at alternatives and some of the, the frontline heroes that are, are hoping to um, you know, change our reliance on plastic. We have a film that looks at surfers, women surfers, and how challenged they have been in, in a male dominated sport and trying to fight for equity uh, in, in surfing. So those are a few of our films in the pipeline. And the Loser, the Loser film, The Last Place on Earth will probably be uh, the next film that you'll see out, out in the public domain. Um, which would be when do you know? Hopefully 2023. Okay. Yeah. And then do you think all of the poaching going on could cause, cause some sea animals to go extinct? Uh, yeah, most, most definitely. I think the vaquita is, is an example and that's not necessarily poaching, but poaching for a 
Totoaba. So the Totoaba is an endangered fish as well that lives in that same habitat. And there's a high price tag on the fish bladder from the Totoaba. And so the Totoaba is a huge, huge fish and it gets the dolphins, the vaquitas get, get the porpoises get caught in those fishing nets. But the demand for that fish bladder is so high in Asian markets, it's, it's priced as high as uh, some illicit drugs are priced. And so the demand for that that, that swim bladder is so high that it's it's been nearly impossible to stop the illegal fishing or the illegal poaching in Mexico. And so that that is one example where, yes, uh, that, that vaquita will probably go extinct because of the demand and the poaching of the totoaba, which is also a protected fish. Um, we can look at populations that have been extinct or extirpated or exterminated, uh, and we can look at the wolf. The, the gray wolf has been, you know, exterminated and, and eliminated from so many states and is only making a comeback after a lot of redirecting uh, policies in, in the U.S., right? And uh, a lot of those populations are vulnerable because there's just less than, you know, 50, 60 individuals, like, like the wolves in Yellowstone, for instance. And then have you ever collaborated with Sea Shepherd? So yeah, so Sea Shepherd, you know, there's there's a role and a place for for lots of different strategies and approaches, and uh, Sea Shepherd takes a, a a very direct approach, and we can respect we respect what sea, we, how Sea Shepherd um, approaches some of these issues. Um, we have not collaborated on a campaign necessarily together. Um, so you know, the Sea Shepherd was has been active in the Faroe Islands and in Taiji. And we've, we've had monitors on the ground in Taiji when Sea Shepherd left um, you know, Japan, because eventually they were so uh, direct action that the government kicked them out, so to speak, right? So um, some of those tactics have you know, good and bad consequences, but every, every strategy is really necessary when it comes to thinking about the full spectrum of how we, how we confront some of these, these crimes against nature. And for the most part, OPS focuses on film, right? And then our campaigns are very collaborative. So I can't say that there wouldn't be a time that maybe we would collaborate directly with Sea Shepherd, especially on illegal fishing issues that they're very, very strongly working with governments. Um, and they're doing, a, doing a, a good job down in Mexico with the vaquita and trying to, um, trying to pull up illegal fishing nets and things like that. Um, what has been your biggest accomplishment in your career? Well, um, you know, it's it's interesting because not a not a lot of com accomplishments are long lasting in in the environmental world. You know, you have a new administration comes, and sometimes some of those victories or resolutions or laws that were passed that took ten years to pass just get overturned. But I have to say that. One good example to think about for you guys is um, it happened in the 90s when President Clinton was uh, in office and um, the tiger bone trade, the illegal wildlife trade in tiger bone and rhino horn and elephant ivory. We have a law in the US called the Pelley Amendment. It's an amendment under the, the a Fisheries Act. And, and we are able to use the Pelley Amendment to certify nations or to put them on notice that their activities are undermining conservation. They're undermining biodiversity treaties. And in this case, um, it was the trade in tiger bones. So we brought the Pelley Amendment action against Taiwan and China. And, and at the end of the day, uh, President Clinton actually imposed sanctions on Taiwan. We restricted imports from that country. That's the only time the Pelley Amendment has ever resulted in imposing trade restrictions on a country. So I look at that as a tangible example where, you know, we exposed the problem, you know, we, we, had, we had the video, we had the, the data, we used political interference or laws to um, hold a country accountable. And when they didn't stop the activity as required by law, we were able to restrict imports into our country. In fact, that mechanism is being used now uh, there's two pieces of legislation in California, in New York, and there's a federal legislation that is seeking to prohibit imports of products that are linked to deforestation in other countries. So it's a powerful tool. And I think that's probably one of the most tangible victories I've had. Um, 
many others that are sometimes short lived. Um, you know, my measuring stick is whether we can end all of the cruel and inhumane treatment of wildlife and end commercial commercial wildlife trade and things like that. And those are big, those are big bars to to reach because unfortunately, the um, criminal syndicates, you know, whether it's the mafia and others, are, are deeply involved in some of this international trade, and it's it's really difficult to to, to shut down that activity. Then on that note, how do you stay hopeful with the amount of animals that are endangered and how hard it is to make change? Hmm. By talking to people like you guys <laughs> to, to see to see the the hope in the the youth and 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 the up and coming generations that are so profoundly aware and that that care and that want to shape their lives around caring and, and taking action. And so I'm so encouraged by, by the youth movement and you, you know, you guys are our future. So yeah, it gets, it gets dark, it gets dark over here. There's dark days <laughs> for sure. And especially when you're looking at, at film of these crimes, you know, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. I fall to my knees every day, but then I find ways to, to have hope and that just, and you know, um, there's a there's a quote that that says action is the antidote to despair, and it's true. So if if you keep if you keep doing, you keep acting, you keep caring, um, you'll have the ripple effect. You'll have the ripple effect, and that matters. I do believe in the power of one. And we have a question about a more current event going on. Do you have any understanding on why some gray wolves were relisted on the Endangered Species Act yesterday, but not all of them? The Northern Rocky gray wolves weren't relisted. That's a great question. And even some in, in the NGO community were confused about that. So the Northern Rocky Mountain wolf populations were uh, delisted specifically as a, as a group under congressional action. There was an amendment that was brought forward in 2009 and then re resulted in the separate delisting in 2011, which gave those states uh, control over wolf management. So that was a congressional uh, strategy that one, one Congress member succeeded in and returned wolf management to state control for um, Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and parts of, of Eastern Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. So that population is considered the, the Northern Rocky Mountain population. And there currently is a, a petition was filed with Fish and Wildlife, and they're currently doing a status review of that distinct population, hopefully to see it as, as a distinct population segment that is that can then be returned under federal uh, protection for, for listing. Um, along with the rest of the rest of the gray wolf populations and the other 44 states that they got relisted on that 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 great announcement yesterday. But you know, all all wolves uh, are not protected, and so there's still there's still some work to do. And we actually have a, a petition on our our website to to Interior Secretary Holland to uh, she has the power to um, issue an emergency relisting under her own authority. And we're, we're asking her to do that for the Northern Rocky population segment as well. Well, I think that's all the questions we have then. If you guys have any more, you can go ahead and check out their website. So listed in the chat here, but otherwise, thank you so much for coming here and talking about your organization and everything that's been going on. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Of course, we hope to see you again next year.